Welcome. I'm Phaedra Ruffalo, Senior Director of Market Development at the American Egg Board. The American Egg Board is the National Commodity Marketing Organization for the American Egg Farmers, also known as a checkoff program. The American Egg Board is 100% funded by the U.S. Egg Farmers with oversight by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Established in 1976, our job is to drive demand for the U.S. eggs and egg products through research, education, and promotion. On behalf of the American Egg Farmers, we are excited to introduce EggPro, powered by Ruby, the first comprehensive egg training course. EggPro covers the basics of egg cookery for restaurants to high volume operations, egg safety, and the functionality of the incredible egg, leveraged in food service operations and food manufacturing. With the completion of these courses, you will receive a total of 30 continuing education credit hours from the American Culinary Federation. Here are some of the highlights of each course. Foundations, egg safety, dry heat cooking methods, and using eggs in high volume operations, to egg functionality, which is foaming, aeration, coagulation, and even crystallization control. For today's topic, we will be focusing on current trends of today. This live event will focus on where food service operations can optimize their current menu by creating an off-premise business model that delivers flavor and formats to create on-the-go egg-based menu items. Your hosts today are two of American Egg Board's consultants, Chef Robert Danhai of Flavor360 and Jeff Miller of Cutting Edge Innovation. They will discuss how food service operators can pivot items from dine-in menus to create new portable egg-siting dishes that can translate to all day parts. Thank you again for joining us today to learn all about what makes the egg so incredible. It is an honor to provide this program in partnership with Ruby. Our special thanks to Chef Robert, Dan High, and Jeff Miller for their help in bringing Egg Pro to life. So without further ado, I'll pass this over to Chef Robert and Jeff to tell you more on how to reframe your dine-in menu with more portable egg-centric items, highlighting the incredible egg. Hello folks, welcome to today's webinar. We began development of this course over a year ago when we identified there was a gap of what was available to all of you. So with more than 30 years as a chef, one thing I've come to realize is eggs is one of the most functional and flavorful ingredients on the planet. So of course, this course has something for everybody. So food service operators, recently have seen a, a growth, right, in the consumer's appetite for off-premise dining options. I mean, including home delivery, grab-and-go, curbside pickup, all of it. Our approach on today's webinar is to have Jeff lead off with some updates on the current trends that we're seeing with the small, medium, and large operators that have local, regional, national, if not global operations. Then I'll show you a few examples of how the Just Launch AGPRO Foundations and Functionality course can be a resource for you to help navigate this challenging time in our industry. Hey, Jeff, how about you tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing happening out in the industry recently? Hi, I'm Jeff Miller. I know that many of you work at an operation that is mostly sit-down business and might be thinking, how do I transition to off-premise for my menu? Sure, you know, it's easy if you're a place that already has a drive through and your business is built for to go. But what if you're a restaurant that sells a lot of products like omelets? How do you take popular sit down meals like omelets and make them portable? Well, I know Egg Pro has tremendous resources in the course to make items like the classic French omelet or the American folded omelet. But what happens when you want to take that omelet and turn it into something that you can eat on the go? Robert, I'd imagine this can take some pretty out-of-the-box thinking, uh, and I think you have a pretty fun and interesting way to go about this. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Yes, I lead the students through how to make the classic culinary school rolled omelet with the soft, small, creamy curds and that golden yellow exterior. We even cook up a folded American omelet and the griddle-style diner omelet. And while you can certainly package them into go container, sit down and eat it. I find sometimes 
I want to pick up a meal and eat it on the go. So I find some of uh, my, my, most of my inspirations, frankly, uh, of on-the-go meals in Southeast Asian food markets. In my second home of Malaysia, about two decades ago, I spotted this excellent recipe that I knew was ready for the American audience. It's an omelet sandwich of sorts. Now, this came from the Malay community in the southern town of Malacca, where we have our home. Uh, they created the sandwich on long, soft, almost like hot dog buns, uh, and they dubbed them Roti John. Now, the word roti um, is from the uh, Sanskrit word that means bread, and the local lore has it that the word John uh, referred to the, the Caucasians that were starting to visit the area more. So this non-Asian sandwich came up to be Roti John. No joke. Now, in Egg Pro, uh, there's even an entire lesson on global egg sandwiches, including this sandwich that's now known as the walking omelet. Uh, so in the global egg sandwiches lesson of Egg Pro, we've included a, a more contemporary version that you can follow along step by step, understand how it comes together, and then you can make your versions. Thanks, Robert. That sounds delicious. And uh, speaking of sandwiches, did you know that sandwiches have been the driver of breakfast out of home over the past few years? In fact, if you're successful at breakfast on the go, you probably already do a great job with breakfast sandwiches. And if you're looking for where to start, start with the basics. The three most popular sandwiches are the bacon, egg and cheese, the sausage, egg and cheese, and the ham, egg and cheese. So you should have some variation on those. So for variation, consider different breads, English muffins, bagels, croissants, and of course, biscuits. Most operators can get away with one or two types of cheese like American or white cheddar. I've already mentioned the most popular breakfast meats such as ham, sausage, and everyone's favorite bacon, uh, but poultry and plant-based sausages are on the rise as well. But if you really wanna get breakfast sandwiches right, nothing is more important than having a great quality egg. Think about portability and cooking style when you're deciding on an egg for a sandwich. For instance, scrambled eggs might be great, but you'll need some cheese to kind of glue that together. A fried egg is always delicious. However, you need to think about cooking style so you don't end up with egg all over your shirt while you're on the go. Robert, what sort of advice might you have in choosing the right type of egg for a sandwich? One of the first things that I consider when designing an egg sandwich is the cooking method, Jeff. Right for um, I think a fried egg is one of the most common, and it medium is just right. It's moist and creamy, yet it's not oozy and messy. Now in the course, I teach the students how to make soft, medium, hard, over easy, coddled, everything. Uh, but in a sandwich, I've also seen omelets used, and I think uh, one omelet that most people don't think of that's ideal for sandwich is an Italian frittata. Yeah, an Italian frittata. Um, and so like most of the recipes in the course, we teach the students how to make it in a traditional way, like with a frittata in a saute pan or skillet. Um, but what if you wanna slice it for a sandwich? So we also teach high volume cooking in the course. And so for that, we do an, actually an entire lesson on high volume cooking. And so with that, you can get a large pan and then you can slice it easily and put it inside the sandwiches. Now, remember folks, there's two courses available for you online right now. There's Egg Pro, Egg Foundations, and Egg Functionality. So two different courses. The, the foundation teaches you the how and why, yet the functionality course will go deeper into the, the details of the food science of the why it's happening. Well, I'll stop there. You can all pick up this lesson a little bit later. The great thing about frittatas is that you can create a whole layer of flavor with seasonings, internal garnishes, enabling you to create that signature, best-selling, labor-reduced, profitable menu item. Jeff, what do you want to talk about next? Well, we've talked about the basics in omelets and sandwiches. However, many restaurants have an item they are really well known for. A great example is the popular and delicious shakshuka. Shakshuka is a global dish with tomatoes, peppers, onions, and seasoning simmered in a cast iron serving dish. And then you make some wells for eggs that are cooked directly in that sauce. 
Then it's normally delivered to the table bubbling hot and eaten while sitting down with some delicious crusty bread. So how do you take a dish like this and rethink it to make it more portable? Robert, what do you think? I bet you have some great ideas on this as well. Well, Jeff, as an R&D chef, I can immediately think of two areas to consider, uh, the cooking technique of the eggs and the assembly or architecture of the dish, right? So for the eggs, uh, instead of essentially poaching the eggs inside the sauce, um, you know, each time you do an order, um, you can batch cook the eggs. So you can batch cook them fried perhaps, coddled or poached, and then, uh, and you can do that in large batches. We show you in the course how to use a combi oven to do all those. And then for the technique to have a more consistent quality and portioning is to actually make the sauce ahead. So now you've got the pre-cooked eggs, you've got the sauce, you take the off-premise container, put the sauce in it, add the egg, nestle it in, put the garnish, keep it chilled. Uh, and so when it's ordered, people can take that, they can take it home or to the office and heat it for a complete meal. And of course, if they want it hot, they're gonna eat it soon, bring the sauce up to boil, put the egg on and off you go. This is what I personally love about eggs. They're infinitely flexible, right? And they can be cooked and served in, in countless ways. So I said this course as something for everybody. So uh, Jeff, uh, let's, let's, let's cover off on one more topic. What do you wanna talk about? Okay, if you really wanna talk about items that are great for off-premise, what if we turn our attention to something that you may not be thinking about like beverages? Believe it or not, eggs actually go really well in beverages and beverages are great for off-premise. Beverages are ordered more frequently and they have excellent profitability. Recently, we've seen some introductions like a major chain that introduced a cloud macchiato, which has a fluffy foam that's actually fortified by egg whites. When you think about beverages, you should think about multiple occasions as well. Perhaps a guest is looking to be energized with coffee or tea, or they might be looking for something indulgent to reward and treat themselves. And of course, sometimes a guest is just looking to be refreshed and quench their thirst. Let's turn it back over to Robert and see what sort of resources he can share with you that incorporate eggs into beverages. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Yes, that coffee change drink may be a recent success, yet eggs are not new to the beverage scene. Let's take 30 seconds to look what the Egg Foundations course has to offer. At the end of this lesson, you'll be able to list three beverages that utilize eggs, explain egg functionality and resulting flavor attributes of eggs and beverages, understand how to use eggs safely in beverages, be able to prepare a key lime soda, be able to prepare a Vietnamese egg style coffee, be able to prepare a global recipe inspired coffee drink, tiramisu coffee. And that's just a few that can be made and packed to go. As the off-premise category continues to grow, we're discovering, creating, and sharing egg-enriched beverages on the website and in the course. I think one that's especially suited for off-premise travel well is exceptional protein pack smoothie, where a whole hard-boiled egg is pureed into the bananas, yogurt, and peanut butter. Don't knock it until you try it. It's really good. Also, Coming to the website, we just finished a few new excellent recipes. The elderflower foam iced tea, where the egg whites help create this like flavorful foam. And we also did another, another smoothie. I did a honey ginger cacao smoothie that also travels well. In that one, I used liquid pasteurized eggs to increase both the rich flavor and the protein. Wow. That's a lot of excellent ideas for off-premise dining, Jeff. So I see we actually have a fair amount of questions here. So um, now do note everyone, it's not too late to submit your questions. So for everyone on the call, you can still type them in, but I'm just gonna start at the top, Jeff. And if I'm gonna put this one to you, Jeff. Uh, the question from Caleb M is, how long can I wait uh, until I need to refrigerate egg salad sandwiches once I get it to go? Thanks, Robert. Uh, I guess I would think about this two ways. I think if you're an operator, there are very strict recommendations uh, for food safety guidelines, and you should always follow those. And if you're a consumer, I'd really think about 
uh, getting that into the refrigerator as soon as possible because, you know, you don't know how long it may have been out of the refrigerator still under those guidelines. Um, so I would try to get it in there as soon as possible or just eat it right away. I mean, it's an egg salad. It's delicious. <laughs> Why wait if you could eat it instantly? That's a good one. Exactly. I, um, I don't wait at all. <laughs> uh, you know what? I recently did a different egg salad sandwich. Sorry, it's, we're allowed to talk like this. Um, for the website, which was chicken, whole pulled chicken, large course of egg. Because I've always done a really fine egg salad, but I hadn't done much large ones. Have you ever made any large chunked egg salads, Jeff? Yeah, you know, I kind of think about it like potatoes, right? So you've got your mashed potatoes, then you have your smashed potatoes. And I think uh, providing different textures within the sandwich could be something that's really fun. Or even uh, just sliced, right? Like sliced hard-boiled eggs could uh, could go on something yeah. like a, um, a B-E-L-T, right? So bacon, egg, lettuce, and tomato with some sliced eggs, hard-boiled eggs on there as well. Cool. Okay. Well, you know what? <laughs> That's a perfect segue to the next question because somebody had about, you say BLT and how to convert them into something new, right? Um, so here somebody says, please share either way to make deviled eggs or another whole egg preparation. And I'll, I'll take that one just because I think some of you may have seen the uh, email blast about this of coming up. And the photo that we used was a recipe I just made for a deviled egg salad dip. So what is a deviled egg anyway, right? So traditionally, right, cut in half egg, hard boiled egg out, mustard, mayo, um, you know, salt, et cetera, maybe garlic powder, and then sprinkled with paprika. So to me, when I reformat that, what am I gonna do? It's gotta have egg, it's gotta have the paprika, and it needs to have the mustard. So what I did, speaking of fine egg salads, I took hard boiled eggs, chopped them up with, seasoned them heavily with some mustard, some paprika, salt, splash of vinegar, and then, uh, we serve that with kind of like a Melba toast and dust paprika on top. So you can make a large volume of deviled egg dip to serve with pieces instead of cutting and stuffing and making each deviled egg. Um, yeah, so that's that's my deviled egg, uh, a different way of doing it. Jeff, anything from you? I don't know. Deviled eggs. No, that's good as they that are. sounds great. I, I, think you, I think you nailed it, Robert. Well done. Okay, great. Okay, so we still have that. Great, we have a bunch of questions. So, um, ah, there's two questions that I'm going to go. Oh, here, Jeff, this is for you specifically. Jeff, uh, yeah, because Jeff uh, was a VP at Duncan for, for many years, so you've got the big chains. You understand what they do. And so the question here for general, for all chains in general, Jeff, is do the big chains use fresh eggs or fully cooked already? That's a great question. I would say, you know, it varies by chain. So they use both. Uh, every chain has different operations and it really depends on what type of operations they have. So if they're really built around, you know, cooking, then they might do fresh cracked eggs. Uh, but if they're built around, you know, assembly, they're going to use a pre-made egg product. And the interesting thing is, is that some of the biggest chains out there use both. And both of them are great quality. So I wouldn't assume, you know, right off the bat that a pre-cooked egg product is somehow inferior. In fact, some of the highest volume operations out there use pre-cooked eggs and people love them and eat them and order them every day. So it really depends on the back of house operations. And you can think about that yourself for different uh, areas. You might want to have pre-cooked products ready to go for high volume time periods. And then in the slower periods, maybe you're making them to order. So it's it, it's kind of like that same way of thinking about batch cooking ahead of time for for volume versus cooking to order. Right. Oh, okay. And hey, Jeff. So in in the back of the house, you talk about operations, and what what I'm finding with chefs that I'm talking to, especially those that are more independent, smaller operators that haven't had the experience of setting up, you know, through a formal R and D process, and you know, bringing in suppliers, and just a little bit less formal. Um, and they're moving into now being required to do off premise more so. Um, I know one piece of equipment I've seen in some of the chains, which for fresh eggs, where uh, we don't need to go into the exact name, but basically it's a griddle with a lid that's got the six or eight rings that you crack the fresh eggs, close them. Um, what's the nickname? I'm sure there's some nickname, but to me, 
that seems like a way that it might be a piece of equipment that a smaller operator may invest in. They can use it for eggs and maybe other things. What do you think? Yeah, that, that griddle is very popular. You'll find it at a lot of the, the different food shows. I, um, I don't know if I, I'm supposed to mention who makes it, uh, it's, uh, but it's Antunes, uh, and they make this great little egg cooker griddle. So it has these six little compartments you can crack six eggs in. You put the top down, and you put a little water on top, and it steams the eggs, actually, in a little under two minutes. It's a really nice piece of equipment. But the cool thing about that is it's also a griddle, so you can pull those six egg rings up. You could cook uh, bacon on there, ham, or other proteins as well. You can change the shape and the form. So if you don't want a circle, you can do more ovals for omelets. It's really a useful, very versatile tool for a lot of different operations. Huh. Eggs that otherwise, it sounds like. Huh. It, cool. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, let's let's keep going down the list. We got a, we got a lot of questions. So, ah, um, so what we have here is people are asking about when making high vol volume rolled omelets. What's the ratio of the starch to water for the slurry that's incorporated into the egg mixture? This is from Kathleen. So Kathleen apparently is already a student in the class and has seen what's in there. One of the one of the lessons is high volume omelets. And what we came up with this uh, is, I noticed how there's always a line at every university or every action station for omelets. So what I did for this, Jeff, is I made a, a version where I make a slurry. Of, first, I take pasteurized eggs or, or fresh eggs cracked, right? I make a slurry of cornstarch, gallon of water, about a cup of cornstarch, just like we make a slurry. Bring, take some, mix with water, boil the water, add the slurry, bring it to a boil. So we've got a slurry. Then I take for every gallon of fresh eggs, I add two cups of that cornstarch mixture um, and about a, about a teaspoon of salt. So you have this egg slightly starch enhanced mixture. And then you take a half sheet pan, you spray it with some or a quarter sheet pan for that matter, spray it with some fat, add a piece of parchment paper, a little bit more fat, and you'll ladle that on there. And then you bake it. And when it comes out, you've got this beautiful sheet of omelet. We cut those into strips. So then imagine this for your omelet station. Instead of having a cook that really needs to be talented and skilled for that specifically, people want to customize what they put in their omelet. They generally don't say how they want the omelet cooked, right, like a fried egg. So the idea is in the, in the uh, course is we show you how to go step by step to make the omelets and set up the station of here's your omelet sheets kept hot. Here's your internal garnishes, kept hot, your mushrooms, your onions, your ham, your bacon. And then there's the finishing sauces. It might be a cheese sauce. It might be, um, let's say, a gravy or what have you. And so when the guests come up, they can custom and say, hey, what would you like in your omelet today? And, well, I want my bacon. So you take the sheet, bacon, fine, that, fine. You drop it in, you roll it up. That's why it's called a rolled omelet. And then you can put the sauce on for them or they can. And you can have a customized made to order omelet with the filling they want in about 30 seconds. Uh, and so to answer your question, we talked about the ratio of starch, right? We said two cups of starch for a gallon, which one other person asked about what thickness of the omelet, because if you make it too thick, it tends to crack. So it's about a quarter inch or so. And I put 12 ounces of egg mixture in the quarter sheet pan. Folks sign up for the class jump to that lesson. You're allowed to jump around, by the way. Shh, don't tell the instructors. And you can go get that recipe. So uh, so that's that one. Okay, let's get into another question here. Uh, and Jeff, I'm going to put this to you because I, I don't have the answer really. Are there any pre-cooked eggs available with a runny yolk? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. That... Um... That's kind of like a you know hidden treasure. If anyone finds it, please uh, please let me know. But it's really challenging with you know the temperature that egg yolks coagulate at, and with the qualifications around food safety to have a pre cooked product that is going to have a runny yolk. So there's not really anything out there in the industry today. But what I think you know you could do is you could think about that maybe a little bit differently. What's that quality that you're looking for from a runny yolk? It's really that. Uh, gooiness, that richness, that runny deliciousness. And maybe if you can't get that on a pre-cooked egg, what you can do is translate that into a sauce. And if you kind of think about 
hollandaise for a little bit. If you created a hollandaise mayo or a yolk sauce, that could be a way to bring some of that creaminess, richness, maybe even a little saltiness to whatever it is that you're making, like a sandwich. That'd be a great way to make a sandwich more, um, you know, make a kind of like an Eggs Benedict portable, right? Is to have that uh, sauce to, to give you that layer of richness and, and moisture. Right. Huh. The egg yolk sauce is intriguing, Jeff, for a couple of reasons. Is uh, in October, before the madness started, I actually took a trip. Remember mm -hmm. that flying thing we used to do? And I was over in Japan. Yes. And one thing I saw there <laughs> was um, a lot of yolk sauces, like at the table with yakitori, a bowl, a full yolk that hadn't been broken with some soy or the the kind of the glazing mixture in it and then what you do is you you poke it with the tip of your yakitori mix it up and it is just like you said it's pure yolk sauce i saw that in like i don't know i think five different places and to me it was kind of reconfirming because at home probably my Almost every single day, my breakfast, frankly, is a piece of toast. We bake the bread, a fried egg, a couple drops of soy sauce with some avocado. So I've always known soy and egg are phenomenal. But I like your idea of making a yolk sauce because I know it tastes good and you can get the runniness, but it can be a fully cooked, safe, pasteurized egg yolk. Hmm. Yes, and, and, and I would even say th there's two points in there that I think are important, Robert. One, just the richness that egg yolks add. So another thing you can do is kind of make a uh, kind of a condensed aioli where you take egg yolks and you emulsify oil into them. That's a great layer of richness for seafood. Um, that's just straight, you know, pasteurized egg yolks with the oil in there. Um, the other thing is that you can buy pre-pasteurized eggs. So you can cook those pre-pasteurized eggs uh, with a runny yolk and that's gonna be perfectly safe and delicious. That's a good point. Yeah, that was something that uh, really surprised me the first time I saw it, seeing a whole fresh raw egg pasteurized, but right lower temperature, longer time. So that's a, that's a great suggestion. Well, Jeff, this there's a few other questions. I want to ask you one myself. I'm going to jump the line because I'm allowed to. Uh, the topic is off-premise menu solutions. Uh, and so I uh, we want to give some tips. And so what about packaging? Because I find that packaging is one of the most challenging things for off-premise. Any any tips, any, any guides, anything? Great question. I mean, you know, especially at uh, larger chains, really anywhere on the go, packaging, the right packaging is paramount to success. Uh, you know, breakfast, you're normally eating that on the go. Uh, you know, there's a joke that maybe you're steering with your knees and eating, but please don't do that. <laughs> but uh, for a sandwich, you might think about what's the right packaging that's going to hold it and not steam everything to the point where it's soggy. So sometimes there's some perforated foil options or wax options. For baked dishes, you might be thinking a little bit about a variety of options and materials that work well for security so that nothing spills out if you you know step on the brakes or you're putting it in a bag that you're carrying around in the city. Um, and the other thing I'd say is do a test. I mean, this is so important. This, this is so important in any restaurant is be your own customer, order the product and try it out, put it in your packaging and then taste it after five minutes, taste it after 10 minutes and 20 minutes and 30 minutes and see what kind of shelf life you get for it and what kind of packaging help Im helps improve that shelf life. Test it out, figure out what uh, material works best for you. And oh yeah, lastly, uh, think about sustainability. Think about materials that are reusable or recyclable. Right. No, that's a good point, Jeff. And the uh, about the testing, uh, something that, you know, we didn't have when I was back in restaurants and a couple decades ago, there wasn't as much delivery, right, for fine dining, mm -hmm. so to speak. But now it's everywhere. And I think that's a good that's obviously testing is a great recommendation. But to me, I think you also want to test with the third party delivery services, if so. And don't test it by making it, putting it on your counter and check it. That's first. Once you think it's right. Send one to your to your family, send one to a friend, send one to a customer and saying, hey, thanks for coming in last night. Can we buy you lunch? We'd love your feedback. Right. Send them a lunch and see what they think of the feedback. Uh, that's just my opinion. But I think uh, testing it is a really good point, Jeff. Really good point. And it, hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, and you're right to think about how to use that in a real world scenario. But uh, Robert, I had a question for you. You already discussed yeah. the, the hard boiled egg, putting that right into the smoothie. 
What other egg-centric drinks does the course offer? I mean, I think, uh, you know, was that a key lime soda I saw in the video earlier? Yeah, you know, Jeff, is one thing that when I, you know, eggs are not new to the, you know, beverages, right? They're around. But I, uh, when I was working on the curriculum with the team and I was ideating on what recipes to include, um, I spent a lot of time in Vietnam, right? And what I saw, and it's, uh, there's a recipe, uh, Vietnamese afternoon pick-me-up where they actually take whole eggs there, uh, they add condensed milk to it, uh, fresh lime juice, and they beat that up. And then they add a soda water and serve it over ice. It's an afternoon, fresh, delicious. And, um, and with summer coming, right, it's getting hot and humid. So I think this would be a great, a great dish. Now, in a food service setting, I'd use pasteurized egg yolks as we do in the, in the course. And, um, and then you can also, the great thing about using pasteurized yolks from a container is that you can make large batches quickly. So that's one of that's one of them. There's the key lime. So there's also a uh, a Vietnamese egg coffee, and uh, yeah, that that key lime. But you know what? I have to be honest, Jeff. Pure marketing speak. Instead of calling a Vietnamese key lime or egg and lime soda, we just called it a key lime soda. Use key lime, and we thought people would get it. Right? Everyone has a key lime pie. Can I drink one? I'm in. So yeah, that's that's the one that that's one of them that's in there. It sounds great, and that's a, that's a great point about even just menu strategy. Just that point about making something that seems exotic feel familiar. That familiarity with a bit of a twist, instead of it calling it the Vietnamese key lime soda, calling it the just the key lime pie type soda. I just think people would understand that better. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Yeah. And, and also for off premise, what this topic is today is to me, the reason I bring that one up is, you know, it's a nice drink. Right. And so it, it's something people are used to used to. The Vietnamese coffee could actually be in there. And there's even a tiramisu coffee that we have in there that has a whipped cream on it. And all of those are good to go. Right. And I think that's however it's delivered to you. Hey, Jeff, you know, let me do this. Let me answer a couple of other questions that came in, if that's OK. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Here's one. We got this. Okay. We answered one of them. They're asking about um, about using pasteurized eggs. There's a substitute for that, right? Of course, you can pasteurize your own egg yolks by taking the egg yolks, putting it with some of that lime juice, because if you put acid, it helps slow down the, it rises the temperature of coagulation. And then I cook those yolks over a uh, bain marie, over a water bath until they're past 165. So you can pasteurize your own yolks. Um, but that's okay. You don't have to buy them. And about buying eggs, someone has asked about how to find different egg products because a lot of restaurants don't know, right? And it's not just look at your broadline distributors catalog because they may not have it. So the American Egg Board on the AEB.org website has a buyer's guide. Now as American Egg Board, we're agnostic. So we're not going to say any specific person, but there's actually a PDF that you can download. It's got uh, a bunch of different suppliers. It's got uh, all of what they're making or some of the things that we're making. And then you could find what you want, contact them, and and see if there's an egg product that's ready for the operation. Yeah. Okay. There's another that. question here. Please. Go right ahead, Jeff. Oh, yes. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. I, I was just going to say, I would even add to that. There's a cool interactive part to that buyer's guide. You can actually plug in what you're looking for. So you might just say whole eggs uh, and I need them either refrigerated or frozen and I need them either pre-cooked or, or, or um, liquid in a bag. Oh. And what that buyer's guide will actually do is populate a list of several suppliers that you could contact to see if they can help you know supply your restaurant or operation with the products that you're looking for so you might even find things you didn't expect in there as well i you know what i'm kind of embarrassed to say jeff i, I didn't realize that it had that that search capability but that's certainly uh useful and you know you know jeff i i've been I mean, if you're a cook Okay, if you're a human being, you've probably been eating eggs since you were a child. If you're a cook, you've been relying, right? I mean, if you're a cook, you've been relying on it. If you're a chef, you're dependent on all the different functionalities mm -hmm. of eggs, et cetera. And, um, 
uh, I brought that up for actually a reason, but it was about the buyer's guide and the functionality. And I'm going to go back to Wayne's questions because I don't remember what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> so someone's asking, someone's, uh, I'm just being honest, right? Come on. It's a live webinar, folks. What are the other delicious things you've seen around Asia with Egg Chef Dan Hai? Oh, goodness. Do you have the next, what do we have? 25 minutes? I could go on. <laughs> let me give you, let me give you one that I, I was, I was speechless. And Jeff, you know me well enough. That doesn't happen often. So I'm in Tan Hoa, which is we were filming Taste of Vietnam in North North Vietnam. And I'm walking through the street and there's a dish called Ban Kung, which is a, a fresh egg, uh, excuse me, rice paper noodle. So they make a noodle, right? The Vietnamese make the fresh noodle and you you roll it up or just cut it up and you eat it dipped in sauces. So I saw this one lady. She, she takes the steamer, right? So it's a pot. It's got the cloth over it. She puts the fresh rice flour batter on there, rice batter. It starts to steam and form a noodle. Then she cracked an egg on top of it. I was like, what? And then she covered it for a moment. The noodle uh, kind of uh, solidified. Then she took a bamboo stick. I have one in my test kitchen here. And she folded it over. So now you've got in a rice noodle, beautiful, supple, just like delicious fresh rice noodle. And she turned it over into a bowl. In the middle is a steamed egg with a liquid yolk. Then she proceeds to take some fried shallots, uh, that um, fried shallots, put that on top, and then spoon a little bit of nook chong, the fish sauce, chili, garlic mixture on top of it. And this was breakfast, by the way. And so you pick up those noodles and Oh my goodness. It was the most, most amazing thing I've ever had in my life. And I was like, I never thought about putting an egg inside a noodle. Now I made ramen the other day and I put eggs in the noodle, but I didn't, I never wrapped them in there. What do you think about that, Jeff? <laughs> I love it. I don't, I don't think I can top it, but I feel like, you know, I feel like I have to try to tell my own version of my Asia Please. egg story on the street. And, uh, you know, uh, we were, doing a breakfast tour in Shanghai. I, I got to travel to a lot of interesting markets when I was with Duncan and we were traveling in all these little back alleys and a lot of the, the breakfast was um, on the go as well, but it was made by street vendors. Yeah. And there is a product called John Bing. It's, it's this kind of, uh, it's usually like a mung bean flour pancake that's made. And this woman and her daughter were, her, her young daughter were there and it was, she was so adorable. The, the little girl was helping her mother and handing her ingredients. But what she did was she had this huge iron pot and it had a fire inside. And then there was a cast iron top and that became like a giant crepe maker. And she would put the batter on the top of that uh, cast iron plate and it would start to crisp up. Then after she flipped it, she cracked two eggs on it and spread the eggs around. They be began to cook right on this crepe. And then she would add things like scallions and hoisin. And traditionally, uh, the Mandarin translation was fried crispy thing, but it was this beautiful, like crispy wonton cracker. And others in line would also take uh, another Chinese kind of staple for breakfast, which was a, a long fried donut. And they would buy that and some rice milk. So some people would take their donut and put it inside this beautiful crepe, and then it would get wrapped up cut in half and handed to you. And we've just started to see that come into the U.S. in the last few years as well. So that was another delicious breakfast innovation that we thought was just amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was that was on par. That was awesome. So um, <laughs> no, that, that's I, I saw that once in Beijing and, and similar, but I've never seen someone put the yu char kue, the, the yu tiao, the donut, so to speak, in the middle of it, mm. which, uh, yeah, that sounds great. Hey, uh, so Jeff, uh, here's a question for you. We, we discussed uh, different signature dishes, right? Um, wondering what are some innovative signature dishes that people can add to the menu that work great for off-premise, right? What are some things that are good for off-premise? Yeah, I would say, you know, if you haven't thought about it, I would think a little bit about bowls. Uh, I, I, you know, it sounds funny, right? Because bowls are actually a plateware, a dish, but they've turned themselves into this wonderful menu category. And if you think about the, the traditional diner that you might go to, they've got plates, right? They've got skillets, they've got omelets, they've got uh, eggs benedicts, 
But, but I would say a new platform or an emerging platform that's very trendy and popular with consumers are bowls. And you can think about that two ways. One way would be scrambled eggs as the base of the bowl. So maybe you've got some scrambled eggs, some spicy chorizo, some cheddar cheese. Uh, perhaps on the top of that, you have some beautiful sliced avocado, maybe some pickled red onion and some crema. That would be a gorgeous, satisfying bowl, high in protein, you know, easy to eat on the go. Think about like a, a salad, right? So if you've got a salad, you know, things are all chopped up. They're put in a bowl. They're easy to eat on the go. And um, the other way to think about bowls are, are a little bit more composed. So maybe there's something that's, uh, you know, very... Uh, nutritious like a grain blend maybe you have grains and lentils with some dressing and that becomes the base of the bowl and then you could have some roasted chicken some greens some spices and on top the egg becomes the the feature garnish right two beautiful fried eggs on top or or a, a six minute egg where you you have a jammy yolk and and that just becomes this gorgeous garnish and I, I think either one of those could be a great way to add a new platform to excite and delight your consumers. Yeah, those sound great. Yeah, bowls, especially for nowadays, right? Loaded in, it, it seems uh, efficient, right? And a great way to layer physically different textures. That sounds yummy. Uh, let me see. There's a couple other questions, Jeff, and I'll see if you have any others for me. Here's one I want to uh, – what other suggestions do you recommend using eggs on salads aside from hard-boiled eggs? I'll, I'll, I'll mention a couple because um, – and then, Jeff, if you have any others. One mm -hmm. is what I've seen on salads, and uh, you, know, you make a, an omelet of a sort. So make a mixture of eggs, and you can season it, color it, flavor it of all different ways. Make thin strips of it and then cut them into almost like ribbons, right? And then those ribbons can go into the salad. I, I've seen this traditionally kind of like the tofu strips in Japan, the uh, yuba or in um, China. But I like the egg. It has a beautiful texture to it. And then I know you said besides hard-boiled eggs, but I did a recipe a few months ago. It was a hard-boiled egg. However, wait for it, folks. Took the hard-boiled egg while it was still warm, smashed it, and then pan-fried it before I put it on the salad. And I'd never done that before. Actually, a pan-fried, hard-boiled egg, it's really good. Um, Jeff, what else? What else on salads with um, besides hard-boiled eggs? So I, I loved your thoughts, Robert. There's, um, you know, I, I think that just a, a nice kind of sunny side up egg can be a nice addition to a, to a salad. The other thing about eggs and vegetables together is that the fat that's in the yolk helps you absorb the vitamins in the greens. So it's really, really great to pair eggs and greens together for nutrition. Um, and then in addition to that, I, I kind of think back to some of the traditional culinary combinations where you've got a beautiful, uh, the French asparagus salad with a poached egg and uh, you know maybe a little bacon for garnish that could be really delicious or the uh, Leonese salad um, and then uh, if you want to be a little bit more indulgent I think doing something like a scotched egg where you have the egg that's still got the jammy yolk uh, completely surrounded in sausage you could even make it a turkey sausage and then bread it in deep fried if you were to cut that in half and put that on top of a salad I think that would just take it to the next level Oh my goodness, yeah. You know what? I saw in Hawaii last year, Jeff. Sounds like a gal. Oh, this was this is that no, wasn't a work trip. I was in Hawaii and I was at the farmer's market and someone took, I don't know if you know the dish, the, the egg-based dish called Loco Moco. You ever heard of that, Jeff? The Hawaiian fried no, egg thing? No, I haven't. Yeah, Don't it's a um, it. local. Mo yeah, it's like it's a stick. It's a short grain rice or medium grain rice on a plate, usually cups of it. Uh, a fried egg, usually some grilled like short ribs, like Calbee short rib, that style from Hawaii. Um, I think maybe some spam or something. I think it's actually spam, the ham, and the spam, the egg, and and that. But I saw that, and uh, I was in. That's the traditional dish. I'm at a farmer's market, and some folks did exactly what you said. They took a whole egg. But then they wrapped it with breakfast sausage of a sort, right? They seasoned it like that. Then they breaded it. Then this was interesting for operations, Jeff, is I've never seen this before. They had it vacuum packed like that, still in the bread. Right? Then they, they held it warm 
because it would take too long to warm that all the way through, but they kept it out of the danger zone. They kept it still liquid. And when the order came in, this is at a farmer's market. They opened it up, they cut it, they deep fried it. So the egg was hot. It was perfectly cooked. You had egg, you had sausage, you had breadcrumbs. They served it on rice with a miso gravy. <laughs> so we did that recipe and it's on the egg board site. So we, we took their idea. I told them I was going to, and we came up with a version that's on the website now. Uh, I think I'm going to make yeah. that uh, tomorrow morning for breakfast, Robert. I think I have to now. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. You know, I so, do have a, another yeah. question for you, Robert. Uh, let let yeah. me jump in here with one. You mentioned before tiramisu coffee. Now, yeah. like, I have a lot of background in coffee. I could see that being a drink either for a cafe or fast casual or casual, really kind of at a variety of price points. But um, the combination isn't so obvious. Maybe tell me a little bit more about that. It, it, it's funny you say that, Jeff, about it not being obvious, right? Well, first of all, if you think about eggs have, they have more than 20 functionalities, right? I mean, coagulation is one of the most common egg functionalities, I'd say, um, that's relied on by cooks and chefs. Uh, and so, but there's so many others. Actually, there, the functionality course has an in-depth lesson on the science of why eggs earn their reputation as incredible egg. But for that recipe, what I did, because eggs are very typical, mixed in with the mascarpone to enrich it. Uh, I'm not a, a specialist in Italian cuisine, but the tiramisu I've seen, what we did for this is we wanted the functionality of coagulation and we wanted the functionality of flavor. And so for that, um, I make a stirred custard with the egg yolks, the condensed milk, and um, the mascarpone cheese, chill it, add the cream, and then that goes in the, in the charged canisters, right? And then um, the great thing is you can make that in large batches. You can even divide it into canisters ahead of time. And then when an order comes in for on-site or off-premise, you just dispense any coffee that you have whatever they'd like, maybe an Italian roast would be appropriate. And then you turn that over and you dispense this beautiful, thick, creamy, mascarpone, egg enriched, egg thickened topping. And then what do you serve it with? Of course, a lady's finger, which is traditionally in the tiramisu. So that was my, my riff uh, that we put in the course on how to make that from beginning to end. And dude, Sorry, dude, if I can call you dude, taking the, sir, taking the, the lady fingers and dipping it into that cream and then into the coffee. It, let's just say it's good. Wow. <laughs> you, can, you can call me dude, Robert, and uh, anytime we're friends. So everyone knows okay. we're close like friends. Uh, you know, I, I do see another question here. Oh, just a, a statement and yeah. then, a, then a question. One was, I, I love John Bing and always have it in the morning when I go back to China. Red fermented bean curd paste is also a staple flavor. Catherine, thank you for that. Absolutely correct. Uh, and then she asked a question, what do you think about oh. pickled eggs, i.e. beet pickled eggs, and what kind of pickling spices might one use? The uh, Robert, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And, and one thing I'll just say is, I was at a restaurant in Seattle that used kind of onion skins to hard boil their eggs and it gave them this beautiful mahogany color and this wonderful flavor. It was also at another uh, restaurant in LA that used uh, black tea to give it that yep. similar, just beautiful mahogany color. So Robert, any, any thoughts on pickling or um, other, other spice blends for, for hard boiled eggs? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. You mentioned about the tea eggs. The one thing I want to elaborate on what you explained, Jeff, is folks, you hard boil the egg, leave the shell on, you crack the shell, and then you drop it gently into a really intense black tea. Now, uh, you can put all the spices, the star anise, the cinnamon, and then what happens, it saturates. And then when you peel it the next day, you've got this marbled look. Now I've done that, Jeff. Uh, I tried that with turmeric in a pickled egg format because tea eggs, aren't pickled. However, I think adding that layer of flavor is delicious. So doing like a turmeric pickle with lemongrass and all those type of things, and then pickling it, I haven't tried it, but I can imagine the cracking format. Imagine that with the brilliant, you know, yellow turmeric stain through it. And then if you sprinkled it with some, uh, some chili or something, it would just be gorgeous. Yeah. Huh. So regular pickling spices, but also Anything that I pickle or brine with, I think would be good. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, we have a couple more questions. We've got 10 minutes next, folks, but I have another question for you, Jeff. Um, let me see. Um, so one thing we haven't really discussed is bundling or family meals. You know, any, oh yeah, yeah, any, any thoughts with that? Yeah, you know, I think um, family meals are becoming more and more popular. Uh, they've become very popular recently. And I, I really think they're going to be here to stay. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why you might want to do this. One, um, if people are going out and they're going out a little less right now, it's a great way to get a high dollar purchase for your operation. Uh, but one of the keys is really making it more convenient than cooking at home. It has to be really easy to order. It has to have everything the group might need uh, for the meal, but also, and probably most importantly for a meal like this, it, it still has to be a value. We've all seen the commercials on TV for, you know, lunch and dinner, family meals. Uh, the same would be for eggs and breakfast. And I think it's, it's probably a little bit ripe for innovation. You know, imagine a uh, Sunday brunch to go at the right price, has everything you need. You can bring it home to your family or to the group that you're with and have it all out on the table. I think that's an area that could be really interesting for breakfast. Yeah. It, you know, Jeff, I've seen that a lot just in the last month or so, some restaurants I'm here in LA right now. And, uh, and what's interesting to me that's different than I've seen before and this is what's changed, I think, this is just my, my, my optics on it, is the, the restaurant in the past, they did to go or take out or delivery as kind of a half to, yeah, we'll do some of it, but we're not going to do this food because it's not going to travel well because we designed it for a restaurant. And the whole right. business model was based on serving it. But now what I've seen is people are charging the same price, right, for this, and now you have no dishes, no service, no, not all those other things. However, no dishes, not from cooking, but from serving. But what I've seen the different change here, Jeff, is it's not using to-go containers. It's really curating and spending anywhere from 6 to $10 on the packaging itself. But the meals are 90 to, you know, you have a family meal. It's 90, it's 150. So you, it comes home when you open it up, you're like, wow. Like you said earlier about yeah. sustainable, it's nice packaging. It's not just foil, nothing wrong with aluminum foil, but mm. it's hard to charge $40 for an entree or $20, $30 for an entree if it's not going to be in something nice, right? Right. Right. That's great. Yeah. Okay. We're wrapping it up here, Jeff. I'm going to offer you one, uh, one more question to me if you have anything. Otherwise, we can keep going. Anything from your side? Yeah, you know, I, I had written down another one here. We'd already discussed uh, how shikshuka can be reformatted to make it easier to assemble. Um, I mean, you're mm. a chef, right? And as you think about things from a flavor perspective, uh, do you have any ideas for our webinar attendees on how they can bring to life these new flavor opportunities? Sure. Yeah, I think shachuka, we mentioned earlier about how to cook the egg differently. But to me, um, I first analyze the elements of a dish, right? So we have the spice enriched tomato based sauce. That sauce often has vegetables or meat in it, which kind of brings it up to complete the meal. Then the eggs are added as a top garnish. Uh, so the sauce, and then there's, you know, then there's the garnish on top of the eggs. So if you have those three elements, I think probably the obvious place to start is the sauce itself. And I mean, what about like a roasted green tomatillo sauce with garlic and chilies? And then you crack some eggs, you put some chili, maybe some chipotle powder on it. And then when it's, when it's shipped or when it's shipped, what an odd way of saying it. when it's delivered, when it's picked up, you've got that ready. But then on the side, you have some fresh salsa and some crunchy tortilla chips. And so at that point, they take it home, they put the fresh salsa, they put the tortilla chips. And frankly, Jeff, I wouldn't even call it chachuca. I would just use that as the idea. Think about how it's something that can be broken into components, made in bulk, and then assembled quickly to order. So I think going kind of that, that Latin, you know, um, uh, you know, South American or like more Mexican roasted tomatillo salsa would be one way. But I can imagine going down every cuisine and just start putting an Italian style one and with the egg and maybe there's some polenta in it, polenta croutons on top. I don't know. Right. I mean, there's so many different ways to make this this ultra portable dish that's easy to pack up 
And, um, but I would keep the crunchy elements separate. That's the last thing I think. Yeah. Okay, Jeff, let me see. Let's see if there's anything else. There's one last question from Natasha. What are the best suggestions for egg sandwiches on the go? We addressed that a little bit about medium being one of the most common ones. What else? Is there any, any other final tips on egg sandwiches, Jeff? What type of egg? Yeah, I, I guess I would say that um, we did address this a little bit just to reiterate some of the important points. As you said, Robert, over medium is great. You can use a pre-cooked egg patty uh, if you have high volume. Let's say maybe you're a college and university and you're looking to do a lot of quick things to go, pre-made breakfast sandwiches in the morning, that would be a great use of them. Um, I think you uh, omelets and frittatas are great, made either in sheet pans and cut to the size of the sandwich or made in molds, those would be great. The, um, the scrambled egg, uh, as mentioned, you, you might need some sort of cheese to kind of keep it together, but a soft scramble can be really delicious for a sandwich as well. And then really just having that right build, that right composition, just like anything else in, in the restaurant business, you know, taste your food, try it out, eat it on the go, and you're going to find combinations that work really well together. It's a great point. And I'm going to finish with one thing to build on that, Jeff, is why pick Please. one egg when you can have more than one? And what I mean by that, think about the Japanese sando that I've been seeing. I don't know if that's right. That doesn't sound Japanese. But the Japanese egg sandwich where there's egg salad, but in the middle of it is a half of a hard-boiled egg. So mm. I'm just saying, why put one type of egg when you can put two types of eggs? Just saying. They come by the dozen. <laughs> Okay, Jeff. Well, uh, thank you for joining me today on the webinar. It's always great to hang out and talk food with you. So thank you. Thanks for and, having uh, me, Robert. And go right ahead. Oh, I was just going to say thanks for having me. And just, you know, for the, for the attendees, just a reminder, if you do need some more ideas for uh, menu ideation or sandwiches or bowls, please go to the aeb.org website. We've got a ton of material there that Chef Robert has been instrumental in creating as well as many other chefs. So Check it out. You're going to find a lot of ideation and inspiration. Thank you, Jeff. Well, folks, thank you to the Ruby team for helping us produce this and have a form. Have a, a form. And folks, check out this course. Dive in through the end of the year. There's no cost. Sign up and uh, you know get your egg on. I don't know. Have a great day, everyone. You take care. Be well.